Please, can you tell us a little bit, a brief description of the inspiration behind some of the work and how the work came to be? Well, um, initially, uh, th this, um, all of this work was made for a book called Ness that I, I made with a um, writer called Ro Robert McFarlane. And I've collaborated with him before on a, a, a different book called Holloway and uh, done most of his covers for his other books as well, actually. But anyway, so um, uh, Ness is named after Orford Ness, which is a, a shingle spit, a, a sort of strange island created by a, a sort of phenomenon called longshore drift on off the coast of Suffolk in, in uh, the east of England. And uh, Orford was was a very important port in like the Middle Ages in I don't know. I, I don't know the date, but it was it was quite a big town. Um, but it's uh, the port was silted up by this longshore drift by the nest that was created right in front of the where the where the port goes out. So um, the 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 town became it dried up, became a, a, a tiny little village. It's quite a cute little village now. It's got a castle, mm. um, and uh, the the nest was used uh, for a long time for military exploration it was a sort of laboratory for for military applications so things like radar uh, more benignly but also less benignly uh, the detonations for uh, nuclear bombs it was it was where they where they tried to develop the the british atomic bomb in the wake of the second world war okay. before it was taken over by the americans so this was a ministry of defense land um, that we yeah had. it was military of defense i think it became um, USAF in the 50s or 60s. I'm not sure. The whole place is sort of wreathed in, in mystery. For, for years, you couldn't go there. No one was allowed to go there at all. It was, it was completely forbidden. It was almost like it wasn't there. It was like a blank spot on the map. Um, and then at the end of the Cold War, it was abandoned. Like many, many, the, the whole of the east of England, there was a lot of USAF air bases, and they were all mothballed or closed. Or, um, and Orphan Nest became this complete wild west. So people were going on there, like local fishermen and farmers would just go over there and nick what they could for scrap, which was incredibly dangerous because the whole place is, is littered with what's called unexploded ordnance. Right. Like okay. Wow. And it it's uh, difficult to um, get onto now. Do they still make it restricted? Uh, it is sort of restricted. Most of it is now run by the National Trust, funny enough. And um, part of it's privately owned. Someone has bought the the lighthouse and the mineral rights for the surrounding ocean bed. Okay, right. So it's a yeah. weird. So you have to kind of you have to go go across on a little boat. So it's sort of limited numbers, and you have to keep to the path if you don't want to get blown up. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about um, how you go about producing some of the background to the drawings and images that you produced? Oh, well, yeah. Um, I started thinking um, that I was... Well, we didn't know what we were going to do, really. Me and Robert, we went to the island and uh, wandered about, and these ideas started to coalesce around the idea of, of this particular building that was it had green tiles inside it was like it was we sort of started calling it the green chapel structure in a very old prose poem in, written in middle english called gawain and the green knight which is a sort of quest ah my internet connection is unstable it's, fine, it's a sort of a it's a quest it's like arthur and the the you know, the knights of the round table sort of style so gawain has to go off the yeah, and uh has all these adventures battles and stuff so Robert started thinking about writing something along those lines. So it's like you go on a quest to not to the nest. So we, for, for that, I, I started off doing work that was, um, I was using the materials on the shore, on, on the actual, on the site. So I was using mud and soot and charcoal, uh, sea coal, things that were washed up on the beach. To, to make the pictures and they were they were quite figurative in that early stage quite angry quite expressive um but because of the nature in which we made the first run of the first edition of the book 
which was lesser press, right. uh, it pr quickly became apparent that uh, it was going to be very, very expensive to reproduce these pictures that I'd made. So I thought, fuck that, I'll do something else. So I, so I started using um, photographic, all, all my photographic records of the island as a sort of resource to do these very detailed, slightly neurotic pen and ink drawings that wow. then I could uh, scan those and get them turned into uh, etched metal plates to, to print in, in the book to make the Lesbos edition. Right, okay, so the um, primary sources were uh, images that you had taken on yeah. and around. Well, the iPhone photos. Okay, um, they're quite detailed, some of the drawings. Um, did you, have you had inspiration? Um, have you drawn like this before, or is there inspiration coming from some of your work in things like liner cut and, and... No, no, it was sort of different. I was, what I was trying to do was, because of the history of the, of the of Orford Ness, um, because of it, it being a sort of military industrial um, phenomenon, I wanted to sort of act a bit like an archaeologist. So in, when you go to an archaeological dig, you know, well, that's, that's one of my part-time jobs as a younger person was that. And they always have a, an artist who does these, who draws all the finds and draws the, the site of the excavation really, really well, brilliantly, beautifully drawn, really carefully, accurate drawing. Yeah. Um, and so I sort of tried to draw like that, sort of really, really careful. So I was, you know, I, I was using perspective and right. you know, all of the things that I vaguely remember from doing technical drawing. Right. Um, that leads me to a question that I wanted to ask you. We've got some wonderful plates in the book you have of um, some of the hagstones. And hagstones are, um, I suppose, um, described as talismans in a way. Or... Yeah, the, um, Robert sort of used these. A hagstone is a, a stone with a hole through the middle of it. So, right. um, And they are supposed to, in mythology, they sort of walk to ward off the evil eye. Mm. And they're supposed to be lucky. So fishermen often tie them to the side of their boats. And you sometimes find them above um, thresholds. Like like a horseshoe, right? So they've got this sort of sort of narrative that's that's already there, and then Rob, Rob used them as a sort of uh, there's a sort of recurring icon throughout the text of the book. So this one of the characters, one of these strange sort of uh, er human characters, his his eyes become become hagstones. Right. So um, I, I I was looking for them a lot on Orford Ness. There's actually they're quite rare over there. Where I live now on the south coast, they're fucking everywhere. So yeah. I've, I've been getting them from, from here, from the south coast. Right, okay. Um, when you went um, to give us some material for the building, which shows some of the working, uh, we received um, a small amount of example of the early letter pressing and actually the type yeah. itself. How important was that in um, the creation of the book for you and Robert? Uh, well, it's it sort of once we decided that it was going to be a letterpress um, production, uh, it really that that sort of you have to plan in a strange way quite a long way ahead because everything has to be made. That you have to you know you have to make cast type, you have to make the etched plates, you have to order the paper, you have to talk to binders, you have to you know it's a whole. There's a whole thing, publish, self-publishing in Leicester Press is kind of an incredibly complicated process. Yeah. Really. Um, but kind of fun, you know. Kind of good fun. And so the, once, you've, once you created the images which ended up as zinc plate um, etching or, or press yeah. um, pieces, um, what was the process like and what did you go through um, to decide to produce the printmaking which appears in the show itself? Oh, yeah, well, that was... Because, because of um, what I said about the industrial archaeology aspect of it, some of the pictures are kind of uh, uh, really, really bleak. You know, they're like the inside of the Green Chapel, for instance, or, or one, of the, one of the ruined um, ziggurat-like structures. So just rubble and broken wire. So probably not very attractive. So what I tried to do was pick, I think there was 12 pictures in the book, plus the cover. Uh, so I try. I, I think for for this show, I've got the eight prettiest ones. Right. Okay. You know, not not the really ugly industrial archaeology. I tried to do something more. Um, 
They are more landscape and seascape. I actually like. Right, okay, yeah. I a bit of a history of making artwork that everybody hates. <laughs> so I left for myself. You, you, you think these are a bit more palatable, do you? I hope so, yeah. yeah. Um, um, the, also, what this, um, for, for this show, we've used a lot of um, precious metal um, to gild these pictures, so to sort of uh, bring some, some life back to this very bleak, very dead um, environment. Because these, the, the, the Green Chapel is this, they're locally in Orford and Suffolk, they, they were, when, when the place was um, a, a top secret military installation, no one knew what these structures were. So you have these sort of strange pyramids on legs. And what they are, uh, this is where they would test the detonators for nuclear bombs. So what it is, is a, is a big concrete table with a roof of shingle. And the idea was when, if the uh, explosion got out of control, the, the sort of table legs, if you like, would get blown out, the table top would fall down and the shingle would smother the blast because shingle is very good um, at absorbing explosive power. So this, what was a very beautiful, if bleak, coastline, acquired this, uh, acquired a very uh, almost evil side to it because it's, it, it was where the instruments for death were tested and perfected. So right. the kill probability, which was one, actually it's, it's a real term, kill probability, um, was, was as high as possible. So these, these weapons would kill as many people as possible. Yeah. So the, the coast of East Anglia, which is, which is very beautiful, became something horrible. So I've tried to uh, do a little bit to try to reverse that, to make these images really beautiful, even though they're, they're images of something actually quite horrible. Mm. Um, making, making, the, making the horrible beautiful is sort of what I try to do. Okay. Um, we've got um, a selection of works. As you say, um, eight um, of the images are mainly landscapes and a seascape. And then the larger print in the show is a interpretation of the dust jacket. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was, that was um, the Let's Press edition had a, uh, just a, a tracing paper dust jacket with a hagstone foiled onto it. Uh, but the, the uh, Penguin edition had to make that look prettier for the shop, so so that was a new drawing. A new drawing. Um, can I go back and uh, can I go back and ask again about the hagstones? Because um, one thing that um, we slipped past was your description of the drawing, the technical style drawing, almost like archaeological drawing. Yeah. Um, the hagstones that we have here are very um, detailed drawings. Yeah. As I understand, you have been producing some more of these. Are they? Uh, an interesting uh, or enjoyable thing to draw? Uh, yeah, I've been drawing them mostly uh, sort of about midnight. Last, last, the last thing I do is, is draw a hagstone for, for a couple of hours. And I'm, I'm sort of, because we're in this horrible situation where I'm talking to you uh, across the ether and we've had to open the show with nobody there and, and no one could actually go in and see them, you know. So we're in this weird, horrible kind of semi-quarantine. And it fit with these sort of, it's such a sort of um, really unprecedented and really quite unpleasant time to exist in. So I'm sort of drawing these as a sort of meditation, but also as a sort of kind of magic. So just because I want, I want what's, when you look through the hagstone, there to be something better the other side. So I'm drawing them for luck, really. Right, okay, great. Um, we've got on the walls of the gallery, um, two of the large drawings you mentioned earlier on. Um, the, oh, yeah. It's the two, the two large um, pieces. Yeah, the ones done with the um, with, uh, charcoal and soot and all that. Yeah. So some of the materials were found on the beach itself. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, you can find quite a lot that will make a mark on a beach. It's sort of uh, the remains of of people's um, fires they've had. So you've got charcoal. Um, there's there's obviously mud, 
clay as well. Um, often you get uh, uh, lumps of chalk washed up and also sea coal, which is, um, I think where, before there were coal mines, people would collect sea coal, which is, comes out, you know, it's, obviously coal is a geological feature. So if there's, if there's a seam of coal in a cliff, then it will become part of the, part of the shingle, become part of the, of the uh, if, eventually it will become sand, but before that it becomes lumps, round lumps of, of, of coal, which is obviously carbon. So you can, you can draw with that. With that. Um, okay, so one of the other things I'd like to know a little bit about is um, your, the way in which um, you've gone about translating um, some of the uh, original pieces into print. I'm sort of hands-on with getting things made. I, I, I've obviously often made them myself, but so I'm kind of one of those really annoying... Uh, can't sort of let things go. It's quite difficult for me to just go, okay, you go and do that, I'll be fine. I, I'm sort of more like, I'll just check, just just want to see if that's, sort of, well, you know. So yeah, I'm a little bit, uh, yeah. yeah. What do you call it? I don't know, control free career. All, everything I do is, is quite, uh, uh, I'm unlearned. I'm, I'm, I'm a, what would you call it, autodidact. So I've, I've not really been taught uh, very much so I've, I've sort of picked things up or, or tried to learn myself from, from books and stuff. But um, this, the work that's in this show here is obviously of a, it's a skill level far above my own. Um, you've always been interested in printmaking in all yeah. types. So in this project, you've managed to um, express yourself in many different forms from but from the drawings through to the plate work right through to screen print it's quite must be quite yeah exciting. well this is the thing one of the the this um show was obviously not meant to happen uh in the way that it has in this sort of virtual unreal ad hoc what we're going to do um way and what it was supposed to be was really a, a kind of a celebration and, a, and an exhibition about the process of printmaking. So um, you obviously know this, but for people uh, who are watching this, don't. Yeah. Um, what the show was going to be was uh, we were going to recreate uh, the, the, a printing, uh, a letter press printing workshop in the, in, the, in the gallery. So we were going to have a proofing press. We were going to have a drying rack. We were going to have some of the plates from the uh, letter press edition of, of Ness. So people could print their own. Uh, they could print their own Hagstone, say, or the, or the, the title page from Ness. Um, so uh, and we were going to have all the sort of detritus, so buckets of used type and bits of bits of type, bits of printing ephemera. But um, of course, then this uh, coronavirus happened and. By that, then we couldn't. We couldn't get the press. We couldn't travel. Nothing. No one could come and see it anyway. So, so instead, we've had to sort of uh, do this kind of thing. Yeah. And um, how's this experience been for you? This going virtual experience. Really weird. It's really strange. I'm having sort of like other like other work things through this Zoom as well. It's kind of strange, but and uh, I'm I'm uh, I am aware of of how much happens in actual physical meetings of people. There's a lot that happens that you obviously aren't quite aware of. Yeah. There's a lot of subtext. There's a lot of things that get agreed on and enthused about and adapted and adopted that is much harder through through um through the internet through zoom like this it's like uh i don't know it's like uh you know those things they have for dangerous chemicals where they have a screen and they have those gloves that you put in and you have to do everything like this with, with yeah. it feels like that it feels like we're at one remove from reality yeah yeah absolutely almost like it is with some of the screens up in front of the shopping now exactly yeah yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we hope we'll be back to some normal normality soon. 
Well, we could do this again, you see, because uh, you know I'm I'm uh, in front of a very strange background, which yeah. could be a different another time. So we should probably do this again. Yes.